close enough. Who is a professor of history at Boston College. Uh, actually, we met uh, through peace and justice work, and he's uh, one of the um, supporters of the 99% movement that's going on around the country. Um, he is from India and has written a book that uh, is being very well received literally around the world. So you are very fortunate to be able to hear uh, Dr. Pratisari. So, away. Thank you, Marlene. Well, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here to talk to you, all of you, about a book that's just been published by me. It came out in August in Europe, and it was published in the United States a few weeks ago. And here's the cover. It's called Why Europe Grew Rich and Asia Did Not, Global Economic Divergence, 1600 to 1850. And what this book is, tries to do is really offer a new answer to what is a very old question, which is why is it that sometime in the late 18th century, um, the path of economic development that Europe took diverged very radically from the kind of economic development that emerged in China or India or other parts of Asia. So, and the path that Europe took from some point in the 18th century led to a, that region of the world becoming much richer than any region of Asia as well as any region of, a, of Africa and also the Americas with the exception in the 19th century of the northeastern part of the United States. So it's, in many ways, it's looking at this key moment when economic divergence emerged, and, but the ramifications of that divergence from the 18th century is still with us today. So it's, it's trying to understand a key moment in the history of the modern world. Now, what a what I want to do today is cover three, three points that are made in the book. The first is, I mean, why do we need a new explanation for this problem now? And lots of people have written about it. And what is it that I have to offer that's different? The second point that I want to talk about in the book is really about one of the, the core sets of arguments in the book, which is the rise of Britain, because it's really in Britain that a new kind of modern industrial economy, which made possible much higher le levels of wealth, emerged first in Europe. And so trying to understand why it emerged there is a key part of trying to understand this problem of why Europe grew rich and Asia did not. And then the third, Part of my talk will look at the, the case of India in the early 19th century and really ask why is it that this, these new wealth creating activities, if we, as we could call it, that emerged in Britain, I mean, they diffused to other parts of Europe after 1800, to France, to Germany, to Belgium, and then from there even into other places in Europe. But why is it that India could not take these up? And I may not have time today to get to this third part. But, uh, we'll see. And if I don't, I mean, you can always read it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so 
why a new explanation? Can everybody he hear me over there? OK, good. Hi, Dan. Um, part, of the, part of the reason for the need for a new explanation now, I mean, I'm a historian of modern India. That's been my area of, of research and writing for a number of years. And, and in the run-up to doing the research and writing for this book, I, I was a specialist in Indian history. That's what I taught as well, for the most part. And what's been happening in Indian history, but also in Chinese history in the last couple of decades, is that a lot of old arguments about the ways in which European society was different or superior to that found in any other region of the world, and in my case, the case of this book, parts of Asia, that Europe was fundamentally different or fundamentally superior. A lot of these arguments are now thought to not hold much water, that these are arguments that emerged out of a kind of European racism. So, and represent fundamentally racist ways of looking at the people of Asia. So the re my book then builds upon a kind of broad world of similarities between Europeans and Asians and tries to offer a, a new kind of explanation for why Europe diverged that starts with this beginning point of similarities. So that's one reason why we need a new explanation, because these old explanations are no longer tenable. The second reason that a, a new explanation is needed, or I thought it was needed, and we'll see what other people think, is that the way that the problem has been understood up till now, the problem of, of divergence between Europe and Asia is anachronistic. Now, can anybody tell me what an anachronistic means? What is it? Anachronistic? Yes. Um, it does have to do with time, so that's a very important part of the definition of the word. Marlene, you could tell us. <laughs> is it, um, it's basically like you're looking backwards from an already uh, given situation. In other words, you, you say, well, Europe is advanced, therefore it must have had certain qualities that made it more advanced. Yeah, I mean, so that's how would I apply it, but it's really applying, l looking at a at a point in, in the past, but with from the vantage point of insights that may have come that come later. So it's really looking at a point in the past, but with the the eyes of someone else in the future, someone who would have been in the future. So it's really. So it's not correct to think about the past in the same way that you, we may think about the present, because the past is a very different kind of place. So that's in, in general terms. But uh, how it's, the way that I apply it in my book is that the way that this problem of divergence has been answered is to try to identify what it is that Europeans had that, that may have made them unique or exceptional or different from Asians, and then their different path of economic development is attributed to that quality. And you could only structure the, uh, an answer this way after you already know the outcome. So it pres and it presumes that outcome in some way. So what I, uh, I offer a different kind of approach, which I will get to in a few minutes. It's much more clearly explained in the book, by the way, all of this, because I spent many, many months just really trying to polish the writing and making it as clear as possible. 
All right, so let's start with, I want to elaborate a bit more on this idea that the advanced areas of Europe and Asia are more similar than has been thought by putting up a couple of images. This is a painting of, of, of a British man in India in the late 18th century. And this is the painting that is on the cover of my book. It's, all, it's, it's from the 1790s in South India. Now I want to put them together. So what are some of the differences you think that, that may be important between these two paintings? Hmm? This one? Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be a lot more going on. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So this is a, this is a more... It's a more kind of complex yeah. scene. Good. And, it, and they both date... Actually, this is a little older. This, I think, is from about 17, in the 1760s. Yeah, yeah. And this is from the 1790s. Oh, you said that was older. Yeah, it's a few decades older. Anything else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't see it that well, but he's playing a game. Yep. The guy on the left. Yeah. And the picture on the left seems like he's really fair of some sort. Exactly. Good. So here we have this British man who's at the center of the, uh, the painting, and he's being served by a bunch of Indians. So does this suggest anything about a hierarchy? And so the European is superior. States. What's that? Where you have a white well. person being served by people of color. Right. Yeah. Same thing, right? Racism, maybe? Yeah. So what we have here, this, in a sense, captures the old kinds of explanations that Europe was at the center of the world, Europeans were the most important actors, and others. Asians and also Africans and Americans were th there somehow to serve the superior force. Instead of that kind of image, I picked this image. And I loved this image when I saw it. And I thought it captures what my book is about. And how would you say this, is, this image is different from that one? What are some of the ways? I mean, we've already, I mean, there. Yeah, so they're equals. This is an Indian. This is a European. They're playing chess. They're at the same level. It's both of them are at the center of the picture, unlike with this one where it's just the European. In this one, it's only the European who gets to smoke the hookah. But here, both the Indian and the European are smoking the hookah. And they're engaged in the same highly rational activity, which is playing a game of chess. So. This is my starting point, rather than Europeans being the dominant actors f from the beginning of time, which is how a lot of history is written. Here, we have an Indian and a European engaging in a, a, the same highly intellectual activity as equals and on the same level. It's an Indian game, so that's even better. And I haven't been able, I can't see this, I have to look at, a, at, a, at this picture of blow up, but a friend of mine saw this, claims that in that, it looks like, from the arrangement of the pieces, it looks like the European is losing. <laughs> but we'll see. So, he looks much more, he looks like he's thinking a lot harder, <laughs> which might suggest that he's losing. So what this does, so where I'm starting is by rejecting a lot of old theories that have been put forward on how Europe was different, Europeans were superior, possessed something that Indians or Chinese or 
people from other parts of the world did not. And so you, these kinds of ideas you can find going back to the 17th century. And some of the stuff from the 17th century I discuss in my book. But what I'm most interested in is theories that are attribute European economic difference to the existence of a highly developed commercial society, highly developed market exchange, trade, all of these things. Ideas that would come from Adam Smith. A lot of these ideas are no longer accepted. Ideas that Europe was uniquely dynamic, economically dynamic, because it possessed capitalism, while Asia was on some kind of Asiatic path, Asiatic mode of production, all these things coming from the writings of Karl Marx are now challenged and have much less, far fewer adherents today, far fewer people believe in that. And ideas that attributed the exceptional European path of development to the work of Max Weber. <coughs> I know some of you are studying sociology with Dan. So have you read Weber? Dan has them. <laughs> and he will be happy to discuss Weber with all of you. But Weber put forward arguments about a different kind of rationality or reason emerging in Europe that then led to this European divergence. And all of these kinds of, these are all kind of classic theories class of uh, economics and, so, and society that, I, that underpin much 20th century writing on the problem of European divergence. And all these things are rejected today. So we need to have a different starting point, which is that of my book. Now, anachronism, coming, just elaborating a little bit more on it, the way that I st structure the my book is not by trying to identify something, what it is that Europeans had and then saying, ah, at this point they had rationality. So they got to this, in, in 1700 they had this form of rationality. So of course by 1900 they'd be far ahead economically. So it's a kind of straight line from point A to point B. What I want to do in the book, or I do in the book, the book is done, thank God, is, um, try to understand why, I mean, there is no predetermined end point in historical development. So what I want to try, what I do in the book is try to understand why it is that different regions of the world, I mean, in Europe and Asia, you know, I don't go beyond just Europe and Asia. I mean, that was quite a lot to do right there. It's other people can follow me, I hope. Maybe some will be inspired to look at the Americas or Africa. Um, why these different parts of the world in Eurasia, why they followed different paths of development? And what were the kinds of social pressures, political needs, economic pressures that elicited a different, different responses? In one case, it produced European divergence, European and modern industrial society. So it's really trying to, uh, seeing that not as just the outcome of some kind of European exceptionalism or superiority or difference, but really as the product of a different process of economic change. So different regions of the world were facing different needs. So of course, you would expect different kinds of paths of development. And this is, in part, in thinking this way, I was inspired by one of the most quoted passages in the writings of Karl Marx at the beginning of this, one of his greatest works, the 18th Brumaire, Marx wrote that men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances, su circumstances existing already given and transmitted from the past. So if these circumstances under which individuals act are different between Europe, India, and China, then we'll have very different kinds of paths of historical change. So 
this is what I mean by anachronism. So instead of presupposing the outcome, I'm trying to understand why a certain outcome e emerged so in a certain place. It was more stress in India than it was in Europe. Are you talking about more the climate? That's what I'm kind of confused about. I'll get to that. I've, this is, I've just been talking, I've been talking quite abstractly, but I'll now, I will now get to add some meat to the bone, so to speak. All right, so in, in my book, I focus on two very important pressures that existed in Britain, but did not exist in India in, in, at all, and existed only partially in China. And I'll, I'll, the two pressures that were impinging upon the British economy, and more widely in some parts of Europe in the 18th century, are first, competition in the global economy. And the British, in the eight, until the late 18th century, were really unable to compete in the global trade in manufactured goods. The most important manufactured good in world trade in the 17th and 18th centuries was Indian cotton textiles. And the British were not able to manufacture textiles that could really compete very effectively against these Indian goods. So this was a pressure that existed in Britain, but since India supplied the world with all these cotton textiles, it didn't feel these same pressures the way the British did. So that's one set of pressures. And this pressure of global competition gave rise to some of the most important innovations in 18th century Europe innovations that both lowered the price and improved the quality of its cotton, of its textiles. So one of the key dimensions of economic, uh, along of divergence in, 18, in the 18th century happened in textiles and came from these pressures. The second pressure that existed in Britain but did not exist in India, Britain, and especially England, very early on, was deforested. And it was, by the 12th, 13th century, there was... Let me interrupt you. Are you talking yeah. about, right, when you're talking about this, are you talking about at that time, was America already founded, or was it not founded? That's what I'm kind of confused. You're talking about the 1800s and the 1850s. So I'm kind of... In the 18th century? Yeah. yeah. So you're, so you're talking about the 1800s and the 1850s, right? So no, no, I'm talking about 1700 to right. the so 1700s. Yeah, in the 1700s. Here. Yeah. So I was going. I was going to go back to the Jerry Diamond theory. That's what I was trying to figure out why Katie was. Yeah, this is long after Jared, the periods that Jared Diamond writes about. The second is deforestation. In England, it was deforested very early. One of the earliest regions of the world to be deforested, and this put enormous pressures on energy supplies in Britain. I mean, alternatives had to be found for wood, which had been the major source of energy throughout human history until very recently. And it was this pressure to find an alternative to wood that led in Britain to the some of the earliest adoption of coal as an alternative source of energy, and then the use of coal in lots of new ways iron smelting being one of the most important, but also the link, the use of coal led to the development of steam power, the steam engine, which was a new form of motor power, we could call it, it was a, a prime mover, a way to move an object or goods or, or things. And the steam engine developed in very close contact with, the, with coal because the steam engine was first used on a large scale to pump water out of coal mines. So as mines became flooded, the steam engine became a way to empty them of their water in order to continue mining. So deforestation put, set, put forward a kind of path of innovation having to do with coal. But if you look at India in the 18th century, India was still very heavily forested continued to be very heavily forested into the late 19th, early 20th century, so it did not face the same pressures of lack of wood, lack of energy. 
So I want to elaborate on these two points a little bit and develop them somewhat. First, I'll show you some images of Indian cotton textiles. Maybe I'll turn off the lights so you can see these a little better. In the 18th century, the cotton textile manufacturers of the Indian subcontinent produced an, an astonishing uh, range of s some really spectacular textiles that were demanded around the world. I mean, this is uh, the border of a textile produced in South India for the Southeast Asian market. And you can see the incredibly vibrant colors, the reds, the yellows, the blues. Can I ask a question real quick? Yes. You said that India had more wood than, uh, than uh, Europe, right? Yep. Do you think that at that time Europe was trying to build an economy and India wasn't really trying to advance in an economy at that point, like Europe? Because most people who like destroy like wood places try to make like houses, you know what I mean? So do you think that Europe was at the point where Europe was building and India really wasn't at that level? No. India, in the 18th century, built up a massive capacity to manufacture textiles. They were ahead. They were ahead. Oh, I thought that's what you were kind of saying, but I wasn't sure what you said about, like, Europe didn't have enough wood, like, India did, so I was thinking maybe Europe used the wood to build houses and to build their economy. So that's what I was trying to No, the Indian economy, in many respects, was more advanced. I mean, if you look at standards, this is something I've argued, if you look at standards of living in the mid-18th century in South India, which was one of the major regions, standards of living were comparable to those, or higher than those of Britain, which was acknowledged to be the richest region of Europe at the time. So, it's, it's more, yep. You say they marketed for Asian? Some of these, yeah, this was manufactured for the Southeast Asian market, as was, this is another cloth from South India ma manufactured and sold in Southeast Asia. This was a shoulder cloth. But Indian cottons also made it as far as Japan. These are, this is the front and the back of a Komodo that's made from sewing together lots of different pieces of Indian cotton cloth. Indian cottons were absolutely central to the slave trade in the 18th century in, in the Atlantic. And this is, these are all the textiles that were exported in order to purchase slaves in West Africa in the 18th century. And this crisscrossed region, the, this is the proportion of textiles that were Indian cotton goods. And if you look at the whole, about a third of the goods that were exchanged for slaves in West Africa in the 18th century were Indian cotton cloth. <coughs> this was the peak of the slave trade. Indian cottons made it to North America you can't see it very clearly, but this shirt, which is a, a piece of printed Indian cloth, is worn by a European in North America in the late 18th century. Trading pet textiles for slaves? Yes. Yeah. And there were a, about, in the 18th century, six million slaves were purchased in West Africa and taken to the Americas. So about two million of them would have been purchased with Indian cotton cloth. North America, Indian cottons were consumed in, in Spanish America. This is a, a robe made from a printed Indian cloth and also in Europe. In Europe, from the 1660s, there was a huge demand for Indian cotton cloth. It gave rise to something called the calico craze, where suddenly everybody seemed to be wearing Indian cotton cloth. Indian cotton cloth suddenly seemed to be used for decoration in houses, for curtains, for upholstery, for curtains around beds. So our closets, bed chambers, curtains, cushions, chairs, and at last bed themselves, bedspreads as well, were nothing but calicos or Indian Isn't stuffs. Cat, yeah, but I think that <laughs> comes from the, from the textile. It's, it originally, the word calico comes from, the, from Calicut, which is a, a port in southwestern India. And it must have been a place where Europeans bought this type of cloth. And then it became calicos to mean that type of cloth. Yes? When you said about the, um, the Indian 
cloths getting traded for slaves? Yes. Is that from a company that made those cloths? Is that company purchasing slaves? What? No, the way it would ha it went through lots of different companies. So um, some of the big companies that purchased the Indian cloth in India were the East India companies, the English East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, and then later the French East India Company were the three most important. And also the Portuguese bought a lot of cloth yeah. separately. Reparations for that? No, to India. No, because they were they were purchasing them. They bought them and then they took them to Europe and that's where the different companies that were trading in slaves, they would buy those cloths and put the, load them on their slave ships and then go to West Africa and sell them. Okay. So just use that as a currency almost. Yeah. Okay. And in Africa, a, a lot of currency, uh, cloth was used as currency in the 18th and in 19th century. And it was, I mean, I've looked at these records and it, it was, I mean, slaves would be, the prices would be given in terms of quantities of cloth or quantities of cloth with iron and so on. Okay. So it was just a direct exchange. Yes, Dan. What I, what I took from that was just that Indian products were the desirable products. When it came to trading for slaves, what they wanted in return was the best cloth, and that was the Indian cloth. Yes. Right. Yes. So and the point is that at this mo in the 18th century, it was not Europe that was the dominant manufacturing region in the world. Yeah. It was India. And reached yep yeah, and reached European markets themselves and part of the there were lots of reasons why Europeans liked these Indian cotton so much part of I mean, was there were light cloths they were washable they were colorful and what other feature of these cloths I mean, the most desirable uh, textile in the 18th century was silk. But silk, as it is, continues to be today, is very expensive compared to other cloths. But it, and what you could do, this is a silk gown, would have been worn by a very rich woman, maybe a member of the upper class, a member of the nobility. And you can see, it would have been decorated, it would have probably been, it would have been embroidered with these beautiful flowers, a beautiful sheen, fall. Here, though, we have a flower seller wearing something that looks really similar. You'd say that these are similar, wouldn't you? This gown and this gown. This is a woman who could not have afforded silk. But now she can wear something, she could wear something very similar to it. This is a piece of Indian cotton. So this would have been a fraction of the price, but would have reproduced the look of the upper class. And this was something that Europeans denounced that you couldn't tell anymore who was rich and who was poor once you had these Indian cottons because there was a kind of social leveling. But this was another reason for its great appeal. It was possible now to be not a wealthy person, but to wear something similar to what the wealthy bought. And as Marlene put it to me, this is, in contemporary parlance, this is like a knockoff of this. A cotton, a knockoff in cotton of a fancy silk gown. <laughs> and we know that from one very a recently discovered source that these cottons penetrated into even the wardrobes of working people. I mean, we, I, we have the case of the flower seller. That's a painting. So we have a sense of what a working person in 18th century Europe may have worn from a visual representation. But we actually have very few sur uh, pieces of clothing that ordinary or working people would have worn in the 18th century because museums, this is part of the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which has a fantastic collection of clothing. But the kind of 
clothing that museums would have saved would have been the rich, the luxurious, the artistic, the piece that was rare, rather than what ordinary people or working people would have worn. But we're lucky to have a huge sample of the kinds of cloth that was used by working people from the London Foundling Hospital, which was an institution established in London to take care of infants or young children who may have been abandoned by their parents or may have been brought to the hospital by their parents to be taken care of if, if their parents could not, no longer afford to feed and clothe them properly. So this was a place that, could, that took care of infants and young children. And when these infants and young children were brought in, various details about them were recorded, where they were found, an estimate of their age, And to make sure that each record, which you can see here, was connected to the right infant or child, a piece of the clothing of that infant and child was snipped off and attached to the document that recorded other details about them. So, was, so we have an, about a thousand of these little snips of cloth, swatches, that really get at what ordinary people would have worn. Now this would have been a fairly expensive piece of cotton, uh, a fairly expensive piece of cotton. And cotton was not cheap in 18th century Europe, cotton cloth. And by no means the cheapest cloth. And this was printed, and you can, this part of the cloth, and it's beautifully printed, the floral pattern. But how could a, an, a working person who would not have been a man or woman of wealth have afforded this cloth, you think? And, and take my word for it, it would have been an expensive piece of cloth, except for a flaw in the cloth. Any thoughts? Did I hear somebody say something back here? Well, this part. The printing and coloring here and here looks flawless, doesn't it? It looks fairly well done. But what about here? Yes? Oh, okay. It's, it's not lined up. <laughs> it's not lined up properly, exactly. I mean, you have these petals, but they're not lined up with the stem of the flower. So it's off, it's off center. So this would have been rejected and would have been sold at a deep discount. And that's why a, a, a working person could have afforded this cloth. If it had been done properly, it would have been out of their price range. They call that seconds, right? Yeah. Seconds, seconds or even maybe even thirds. That's what they thought building was. Yeah. So and this has become in, in the last couple of decades, this, uh, the analysis of objects to try to extract them for historical insight has become a, a really important area of history. And that's part of, there's some of that in this book that I've just written. Excuse me, one second. And my yes, class knows what that is. What is that? <coughs> what kind of source is that? I'm overwhelmed by the words. <laughs> what? A primary source. Thank yes. All right. Now this is another swatch, a couple of swatches. This represents something very different. These are two swatches of cloth made in Britain around 1750. And these are both characteristic of the the types of cloth, or one major type of cloth that was sold in West Africa. And these are checked and striped cotton, cottons made in India. But this, I said, these are two pieces made in Britain. So what we have in Europe from the late 17th century is Europeans trying to manufacture cloth that was of the same quality, of the same style, of the same type as what Indians were making and were sold in places like West Africa and the Middle East. 
So this manufacturer, a British manufacturer, attached these two swatches to a letter that he wrote, that he sent to uh, the a company trading in slaves in West Africa and said, this is the type of cloth that I can make. Why don't you purchase this instead of the Indian stuff? So we have Europeans really trying to out-compete Indians and matching them in terms of price as well as quality. But of course, this, these things couldn't really match what Indians were making because they were not of the proper quality. And what made them of not the proper quality is the fact that Europeans had not really figured out how to make an all cotton cloth. These, both of these pieces are mixtures of linen and cotton, which West Africans generally found to be less appealing than the all cotton stuff that was made in India. So attempts to, to reproduce this cloth were not successful until a cloth could be made from all cotton. And that required yarn that could be, the spinning of yarn of, of high enough quality to weave an all cotton cloth. And that was only possible from the 1770s with the invention of spinning machines, the water frame on the left, the mule on the right, the water frame was invented in the 17th, late 1760s, the mule in the late 1770s. And with these machines, Europeans could now make an all cotton cloth. And the argument of my book is that it was really competition against India, the desire to emulate and then surpass Indian stuff that fueled these extraordinarily important inventions. And you find this in the sources. If you go and look at the writings of cotton, people connected to cotton in 18th century Britain, as well as in 18th century France, they talk about the need to improve the quality of the cloth and the quality as they saw it, what set the quality standard was Indian stuff, Indian goods. So Samuel Crompton, the inventor of the mule, he said that he was motivated to try to improve spinning because he was so grieved at the bad yarn that he had to weave. Richard Arkwright, who was the inventor of the water frame, with the water frame it was possible to now make all cotton cloth and he said these goods made wholly of cotton will be greatly superior in quality to the present species of cotton goods made with linen yarn warps and will bleach, print, wash, and wear better. And a pamphleteer, anonymous pamphleteer who just called himself a friend of the poor wrote in 1780 after these machines had made their appearance in Britain that when I look upon our machines, my heart glows. Perhaps by new improvements, we may vie with the East India goods in fineness and beauty. So it was the particular pressure of competition with Indian goods that led to this path of technological change in Britain, not simply some inherent superiority or exceptionalism. Now, what other point about this is that in this process of emulation, I'm going to put the lights back on because I don't have that many more images. In this process of em trying to emulate Indian goods and surpass them, the British cotton industry was supported by a lot of state action. You know, I know that we, I mean, we live in an era now when the state is seen, is seen as a kind of destructive force when it comes to the economy, the, the state has to be pulled back. But if you look at all successful cases of economic development since the 18th century, Britain being included, the state played a very important role. And this is actually one of the, I think the argument of my book that a lot of people are going to dislike the most. I think it's a lot easier for them to say, give up, um, maybe it's not true, to give up a lot of racist ideas before really giving up ideas about leaving the market to just do its business. But in 1700, 
Indian printed cloth was prohibited from being imported into Britain. And this gave a great spur to a British cloth printing industry, which expanded enormously in the first two decades of the 18th century. In 1720, white cloth, which had been allowed, which the import of which had been permitted, white cloth from India, which was then printed locally in Britain itself, was prohibited, was, was no longer allowed to be imported. And this is what led to the efforts to make an all cotton white cloth in Britain, in part. And it's after about almost 50 years it took for the British to come up with these spinning machines, which allowed them to actually make something that in the way Indians could. So state policy is a really pivotal, pivotal part of the story. You say the state, you're talking about government, right? Yeah, yes. The British government and its kind of protectionism of local manufacturing and the promotion. Also, I mean, what part of the story that I've left out is that from the, late, from the 17th century, the British had been really trying to monopolize trade in the Atlantic and push out the Dutch, which they'd succeeded in doing by the late 17th century. Yes. Basically, they were trying to push the India route. Yeah, they were trying to figure out how they could outcompete India. By them doing that in their country. Yeah. They were saying they wanted to supplant India. And they got away with that. People have gotten away with worse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do I have a few more minutes? Okay, but I want to have some time for questions and things. So that was one piece of the story. And uh, by 1830, the center of the world's ex cl uh, cotton cloth production had migrated from India to Europe, and Europe became the major center for cotton cloth exports to the world economy in the 19th century. So that was one part of this divergence. The second part of this divergence is really the new en energy complex that emerges based on coal, a fossil fuel, which really broke a lot of the, n the natural uh, barriers to economic activity, we could say. And to give you one example, in 1800, Britain consumed 15 million tons of coal per year. And to get an equivalent amount of energy from wood would have required cutting down forests that covered 15 million acres. And the land area of Britain was only 53 million acres. So it, it would have been impossible to achieve the kind of energy use that Britain did by 1800 simply with wood. So coal, the use of mineral energy or inorganic energy or fossil fuel is really an important dimension of the growing wealth of Europe in the 19th century. And coal, with coal, you could build steam engines, which then were connected to things like r wagons to give you railways and ships to give you steamships in the 19th century. Yes? At what time did you say British textiles kind of took over over Indian textiles? In, from, in export markets from the late 18th century, in some, the 1790s, you begin to see British cloth being exported to places like the Middle East with in, and, and they're, they're all manufactured in imitation of the Indian stuff that was being imported earlier into, into places like the Ottoman Empire. And they're given Indian names, marketed in, in, by the British in India with Indian names and things. But it's a process that takes several decades. And then from about the mid 19th century, you have large quantities of British cloth imported into India itself. So coal is connected to the steam engine, but also to iron. And iron could now be manufactured at much more cheaply than it, it could be earlier when the fuel for smelting iron had to be wood. And you had a tremendous expansion in iron use. You could have, have iron bridges, iron buildings. I mean, Multi-story buildings were only made possible once you had iron, which could provide the support to build high, build up. So iron is very, really very much part of our modern world. Now, as I said earlier, Britain was heavily deforested by the 16th century. 
in the, in the 16th, 17th century, you have big increases in the price of wood, which leads to experimentation with coal from a very early period. By the 12th, 13th century, in Britain, you have people experimenting with coal as a new energy source, substituting it for wood. While in India, if you went to eastern India, northern India, northwestern India, west, south, throughout the whole subcontinent, you had a very heavily forested area until the late 19th, early 20th century. So there was really no demand for an alternative source of energy, even though you have large supplies of coal, large deposits of coal in central, eastern, lignite in, in, in South India, which is another form of coal. But none of these things would be really capped till the 19th century. I'll skip these. But in coal as well, it wasn't simply a natural force, the mere existence of coal that led to its use in Britain. And I'd argue, I argue in the book that the state was also, or the government was also critical for the adoption of coal in Britain. In the 18th century, British iron producers were protected from the competition of cheap Swedish and Russian iron. So they could experiment with coal and figure out how to use coal in order to smelt iron. And, and, and until they reduced the cost of their iron production, they were, received the, the support of the state. Coal, a lot of British coal was found here in Newcastle and then put on boats and floated down to London. And the provisioning of London with coal became a, an important government policy because without coal, Londoners froze in the winter. Without coal, Londoners could not cook their, their meals. So to mean, maintain the political peace of London, the British state always wanted to make sure that London was constantly supplied with cheap coal. And, that and this goes back to the 17th century. And the Royal Navy protected this shipment this trade, especially during times of war and during the 18th century. Britain was at war with France for, I think, France would have been right here every year but 16 over that 100-year period. So the Royal Navy played a huge role in protecting the coal trade in order to provision London and also to collect the taxes. The revenues from the coal trade were a very important part of the government revenues for Britain. So, we don't have a kind of natural economy or a natural path to this, the wealth of Europe, but it's really very much emerges through a political process. So to conclude, the industrialization of Britain was a response to pressures not found in the advanced regions of India. The two key elements of that growing wealth of Western Europe was cotton and coal, and the support of the state was absolutely critical to this process of change. Thank you. So we have some time for some questions. Um, at what point did coal become more important than wood? I don't know, I'd have to look that up. Uh, probably around 1700, I'd say. But uh, I've never seen a date attached to that. I, would look, uh, I can look it up, though. It's interesting. But probably sometime around 1700, I would guess. <coughs> end up colonizing India and mm -hmm. taking away all their skills that they had and literally impoverishing India, which was very well off, very wealthy, very well to do, you know? Uh, I know that Jared Diamond talked about uh, <laughs> climate-wise, and I mean, that's what I learned pretty much about, like, yeah. how, like, uh, 
Portugal and Spain kind of had uh, the same climate in which you went from like straight on to India. Mm-hmm. And the rest of it had like the horses and sheep and mm-hmm. all those things that kind of helped them. Yep. Benefit. And I think that was probably one thing I probably played more. Yep. Into uh, Europe, becoming what a Europe king. Well, okay. But Jared Dybit, I mean, most of the book is about Europe and Asia. It's about Eurasia. Yeah. And the fact that all of these goods could move east, west, across from Western Europe all the way yeah, to China and Japan and India. And he really doesn't have too much to say about this later divergence in Eurasia between Europe and India and China. So what I'm doing is really taking up something that he takes up only very briefly at the end of his book. And why is it that Europe then from the 18th century sort of surges ahead of Asia? Right, I mean, he's basically concerned why did the Europeans come over to the Americas and conquer them so quickly? That's what he's saying. And why are the Africans just um, take it, which is stuff we didn't read, but why were they not able to resist the slavers? So that's his main issue. Why didn't the New Guineans develop civilization? Not so much what's happening in India and China. Yeah, and in a later period. Well, in the, in the 19th century, Britain becomes globally dominant and starts to make the rules. But this, this is really before Britain is that powerful to make all the rules. I mean, it, it, they weren't that powerful. It sounds like the Indians were the ones out of India. Which yeah, I mean, it's, it's a kind of classic story of being Britain as a kind of latecomer. Mm-hmm. So it uses the state. And it, many resources to yeah. Maintain. And it was relatively backward, so it had to f- figure out how to get ahead. It's kind of like the U.S. today, you know? Yeah. Like the US well, it today, sounds like they encroached on you. Well, I mean, it's, it, it was a... The industrialization of Britain <laughs> did lead to deindustrialization in India in the 19th century. I mean, you have a tremendous decline in cotton manufacturing. You have a tremendous decline in a lot of metal working stuff because cheap British iron starts to be imported into India, replacing locally made iron and iron products. Yeah, I mean, part of the poverty of India today dates back to the stuff that happened in the 19th century, but it's not something that dates back before the 19th century. It's a much, it's a much more recent phenomenon, is one of the art points that I try to make in this book. I mean, India in the 19th century becomes incredibly impoverished. I mean, in, between 1860 and 1900, somewhere between 20 and 30 million Indians die in famines in India. So, (laughs) well. But I mean, what Edo said was exactly the point he's trying to go against, you know? So so if you look in the United States, we we were a big superpower, but we're declining now because we think we're all that in a bag of chips, right? Meanwhile, smaller countries, knowing that they have all these negatives, are strategizing and, and trying to figure out how they can get ahead. And, you know, and, and, and so that's, I think that's the point. It's not a question of smarts, it's a question of, you know, you're down under, and so how do you get ahead? It's like, why, do, why, do, why are Japanese cars so popular in the United States? They make them better, right? Yeah. So, you know, and, and so and the market for Japanese cars increased while the market for American cars went down because American cars broke down a lot and didn't have, you know, the staying power, you know, and that's because the Japanese said, how can we, we're small, we're, we're little, we're how can we, we yeah, compete? Exactly. Yeah. Dan? Yeah. Okay. I think it's interesting just realize that the, this whole issue of the role of the government in England and mm-hmm. in developing the industry and protecting itself against superior products from outside in order to be able to develop Mm -hmm. when third world, less developed countries of the world today try to do the same thing, they get get labeled as protectionists, they don't get support from international financial agencies, they're considered to be doing something almost immoral, and yet that's exactly what the advanced industrial capitalist countries did to, to get their leap forward, and then they turned around and said, but other parts of the world can't do that, it's against the rules. Exactly. I mean, the United States is a great example. Right. I mean, in the 19th century, the United States had huge tariffs to protect 
local manufacturing from cheap exports from Britain, cotton, iron, all kinds of goods. And Britain itself, which is often taken to be just a miracle of the market, one of the major arguments of my book is to argue, no, it is not just a miracle of the market. It's really a product of lots of state intervention in the market. And we need to be honest about that. And the, in the 19th century, the, the most open economy in the world was probably the Indian economy. And it got totally hammered. So when, if you have free trade, free trade benefits whoever is mo on top. And if you're not on top, you can get totally destroyed. Free trade, not state. Yes. Yeah, we had a uh, speaker in as part of the same series mm -hmm. about Mexico and the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA. Yep. And how once NAFTA was passed, U.S. agricultural products went streaming in at a lower cost, subsidized by the U.S. government. Yep. Right? Um, which should now undercut all these Mexican farmers who then become impoverished, and then they come to the United States, and then we get all bent out of shape about illegal immigration. Yep. Well, there's a great line about that, that about the whole immigration issue. And it's from an immigrant, immigration activist in Britain, where whenever little Englanders, English people complain about all the immigrants, he, he would say to them, well, we're here because you're there. <laughs> so <laughs> the world is interconnected. That's really true. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.